So I think it's time for another live coding session. And just to break from tradition, today I am not going to be writing an assembler. I'm going to be writing a disassembler. So for some context, at the weekend I went to my favourite shop that sells things that other people have thrown away. And I got myself a Typestar 210 Canon electric typewriter. This is a thermal typewriter. Uh, it's a microcontroller based device. You type on the keyboard and it prints stuff using a thermal transfer printer onto paper. I already have one of these typewriters which I turned into a USB keyboard. But when I saw this one, which was considerably bigger and had a full-sized keyboard, I got it hoping that it would be a similar architecture inside but with a socketed ROM because that means I can change the software. And yes, it was indeed a socketed ROM, but the processor, which took me a long time to find, was not the same as the other typewriter. The smaller one used a 6303, which I've been getting interested in, but this one used a CPU called the TLCS90, which I have never, ever heard of before. It's made by Toshiba. Uh, they have documentation and it's online. It's a really interesting thing because it is a redesigned Z80. So it's got all the Z80 registers and it's got all the Z80 instructions, but they've also added a huge number of more instructions, including lots of proper 16-bit operations. So you've got here and with HL. Uh, it's got hardware multiplication and division. It's got a radically redesigned addressing mode system, which means that the instructions are now all orthogonal. Uh, it's got things like you could, uh, stack frame address addressing modes, uh, zero page form. Uh, or any of the 16-bit registers can be used as uh, an index register. It's got a 20-bit wide address bus, which allows it to address way more than 64K of memory. Although, sadly, you can only use this for data. You can't use it for a program. And they've also completely changed the binary encoding of the instructions, which makes it source compatible with the Z80, but not binary compatible, which is really interesting. Here is the base page table of the instruction set. And you can see that if you're used to the Z80 instruction set, it's only got two rows of LDs here, because the other LDs have all been moved onto a base page, uh, onto an extended page. It's got uh, down here that these are the prefix bytes to take you to other pages, except unlike the Z80, the prefix byte encodes the register that it's going to use to, uh, as part of the addressing mode. Instructions can be up to six bytes long. Uh, it's a really interesting thing, and I would like to find out more about it. Except that because nobody's ever heard of it, there's very few programs around to work with it. I found a couple of assemblers, but they're all weird DOS things. Uh, MAME will emulate it because there are a few arcade games that use it, but not very many. And that's about all I found. So I pulled the ROM out of the machine and uh, dumped it, which took longer than I was expecting. So I do have the 256k ROM from the original typewriter. Uh, and you see here are some text messages that appear in the ROM, all to do with typewriters. So if I can figure out how this works, I can write my own software, program it onto an EEPROM, I've got one, stick it in the machine and make it do my own thing. Sadly, it's only got 8K of RAM, which isn't really enough to run a real operating system. It would be nice to run CPM on it, CPM will run on it. I would have to reassemble the CPM programs for the new instruction set. It wouldn't run any CPM software, thus making it a little bit useless. 
but it would run. Of course, it's got no disk interface. It's got a, a rather good keyboard for input and a printer for output, though there is a little LCD on the typewriter as well. But mainly, mainly I'm doing this because it's cool. So this is actually the second time I've tried this. The first time I got a couple of hours into it and then ground to a halt because the approach I was using just wasn't working. Now, disassemblers are not normally particularly complicated, but this instruction set is tricky. The instruction encodings are all kind of weird. For example, if I find a nice, simple 8-bit instruction... Here we go. Add a value to the accumulator. We have how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven different forms for all the different addressing modes. You've got add a register, which in the on this architecture is two bytes rather than the one byte for the Z80. Add a constant, add a dereferenced 16-bit register, add a dereferenced index plus displacement. Uh, add dereferenced HL plus A, which is quite nice. That gives you variable sized byte array access very nicely. Uh, dereference 16 bit constant. Uh, dereference a 8 bit address in zero page. Here are the encodings. And you notice, that, for example, with this one, we have the prefix byte, the E3. Then we have the source address, then we have the opcode. And if we go down to, for example, uh, yeah, the other form of add, which adds to a, a register that's not A or to a memory address, you can see that the you have the prefix bytes, here you've got the address, then you've got the opcode byte, and then you've got the actual constant being added. And what I did was I tried to essentially reverse engineer the instruction encoding rules. Here's the base uh, page of instructions. And if you use the Z80, you'll see it's quite different from the Z80 itself. So we have only two rows, sorry, three rows of LDs where the Z80 would have like masses. And uh, we are limited to copying to and from A, copying constants into a register. Uh, this is here's copying constant to a 16 bit register. Here we are copy 16 bit registers among each other. If we look down to one of the secondary pages that use a prefix byte, here are all the other LD instructions, because they use the, uh, the, the bottom few bits of the prefix byte to determine what register is being referred to. And it's all quite orthogonal. The problem is I kept finding weird little exceptions, and I got less and less sure that the rules I was trying to put together were in any way right. And they get, kept getting more and more complicated as I tried to account for the exceptions. So what I'm going to do instead is to just brute force it. Which is a shame because it would be so much nicer to do it elegantly, but this will be vastly, vastly more reliable. So anyway, let's take a look at the code. I have an empty boilerplate and my normal auto build window up here. So the first thing we need to do is to, well, do that because I haven't got around to putting it in the standard library yet. And let's do some argument parsing and I'm just going to steal that from the assembler. Actually, hang on, I'll load this here. 
Oh yes, this is, by the way, uh, all in Cowgirl, my pet programming language. Right now it's compiling into, uh, well, everything, but the one I'm going to run is the native 386 Linux version. I can also compile into a bunch of different architectures, including CPM, but I'm not going to bother for this. So this program is called CowDis. It takes a option, a mandatory input file name, a optional output file name, and a start hex address. The way this disassembler works is it's just going to work with a raw binary file with no header. So you have to you have an address parameter to tell you where it's going to be, uh, what the base address of the file is. So we don't have a listing file. The input file name is the only mandatory one. Uh, we need some variables up here. The input file name. We've got the output file name. We've got the input file, which is a file control block. This is a large structure that encapsulates whatever the platform needs to refer to a file. So on Linux, it's a file descriptor, plus the buffer. And we want to open the input file. If the output file is not zero, try opening that. And we also need a variable for the start address. And I'm going to assume 16-bit addresses for the time being. OK, parsing the start address is uh, now I want to use the A to I subroutine which returns a signed 32-bit value and the uh, and the advanced pointer to the argument so if the if the advanced pointer does not point to the end of the string, then this means it's a uh, invalid number. So take the parsed result, cast it to a 16-bit integer, and that should be that. I have everything. No, I've ah, oh, I haven't done the standard start error, end error stuff. So let's just copy all these. Oh, and we need two upper as well. Two upper should really be moved into the standard library. The standard library for Calgold needs quite a lot of work. Uh, line num line no oh. Yeah, because I stole this from the assembler. If an error occurs during assembly, then it tells you what line it occurred at. FCB and uint8 are not compatible. Get actually the output file name. Oh, I like languages with typing. Okay, that works. And we want to actually... Oh, yeah, let me just... So here is the executable that's been produced. 44 bytes of code. One thousand three hundred six bytes of code. The Cowgirl linker does really aggressive dead code removal. So if I didn't call parse arguments, 
then it wouldn't have pulled in this subroutine here or any of the uh, or a to i or the argv library or the file library and you end up with a minimal executable that just starts up and shuts down. Uh, please ignore the size of this data segment, that's because it uses cheap and nasty uh, a cheap and nasty way to claim memory from the system. This is really intended for 8-bit systems, so on Linux I just told it, you know, use a megabyte and be done with it. Okay, now we need the actual main subroutine, which is actually oops, going to do the work. Uh, the input file and the output file are loaded. Uh, let's actually do... I'm uh, just thinking about how to output the result. Let's just use print for now, so I'm just going to ignore the output file. So for the input file, when we read instructions, we want to parse them. We have to parse them because otherwise we won't know how long they are and we won't know how many bytes to read. So we have to parse them as we read them. But we also want to copy the instruction into a buffer so that we can output the hex representation and the ASCII representation along with disassembly. So we're going to create a buffer for that, which is six bytes long, because that is the longest instruction that I've seen so far. We may need to change that. And the instruction length. And we're going to create a routine called read byte, which returns a byte. And what this is going to do is uh, read a byte from the input stream. Write it to the buffer. Advance the buffer length. So that every time you call read byte, it'll get automatically copied into the buffer. But this means that in our loop, because we're going to continually read instructions from the input file until we reach the end of the file, at the beginning we want to reset the buffer pointer. Now there is actually one other thing we need to do. The cow goal uh, file abstraction doesn't have an end of file concept because various reasons combining laziness and CPM. So we are we actually have to keep track of the current file position and the uh, length of the file. The input file len is fcb extent of the input file and input file pause is going to start out at I shall put that here so every time we read a byte we need to remember To advance the file position and we want to keep reading bytes until we reach the end of the file. So that should do it for me automatically and it even compiled. Yeah, file size is increasing. That's because it just pulled in SCBX. So here we're going to read each instruction in turn. And in fact, I'm going to add a subroutine to do that. So that 
that will go there. Uh, and we're going to just read one byte for now. After we read the instruction, we want to print it. And uh, no, actually, we're going to print, for now at least, we're going to print it right here. So the first thing is the address, which is file class class. No, hang on. What am I doing? It's the address. So after we read the instruction, we then want to write out the hex bytes. One day I must get round to doing uh, for loops. Okay, so that builds. We have a small binary, 12K, but most of that is debug stuff, mm. 6K. Bear in mind that 6K of which there's only 2K of uh, actual code the rest of it is like overheads. Uh, let's take a look at the DOS version. See, much smaller. And there's always the CPM version, about the same size as the DOS version. But this should now work. So I should be able to run it. I want this one against. We haven't increased the address. Yeah, that was the thing I'd forgotten. So, read instruction will read stuff into the buffer, but won't advance the address. We're only going to advance the address after we've done with each instruction. There we go. But of course, it thinks all instructions are one byte long and it's not doing any disassembly, so the results are actually quite boring. So up here in read instruction, we're actually going to have to pass the instruction and read the various operands. And the way I was going to do that is simply to have four different tables, huge tables, well, two, 256 entries each, containing uh, the instructions needed on what to do to parse these. So it's simplest for the simple instructions like these that take no parameters. For an instruction like this that takes a single, uh, a single byte, this is a two-byte instruction where the second byte is the low byte of the direct page address. We somehow need to tell it to read a byte uh, for use as the parameter. For the more complicated instructions like these, we have to tell it to read a register into wherever we are storing our parameters. Uh, for this one, we want to read a 16-bit value. Then we need to go to one of the other pages to uh, read another byte. Then we need to do whatever that byte says. And eventually, once we've finished, we need to output the instruction. So, 
each of these entries is going to have to contain all this information and the way it's going to happen is basically bytecode, sort of. So let me define a so I'm just thinking about how to do this. Uh, so I'm not going to use a record. In fact, I, it's just going to be an array of strings. So we're going to start at the base template. Of which there are 256. There are also going to be additional 256 byte templates for the other pages. So in fact, we're going to use up a complete kilobyte just of these lookup tables. Uh, each one of these will contain a template, which for template string, uh, which for these four is going to be simple. So I'll just not halt D I E I, halt D I E I. So the idea is we look up the byte in the template and then we do whatever we see here. If it's a lowercase letter, that's a instruction that's just going to be omitted. If it's a uppercase letter, then we're going to want to do something. Um, is that actually correct? Yes, it is. It's going to be... Yeah. So we're actually going to want to have to have 256 items in this, and in fact the compiler will complain because I didn't put a colon in there, because I've been programming in other languages. Wrong number of elements in initializer. We actually do need 256 entries here. Now, uh, we are going to want to have some empty slots. The base page has a few here. The mostly here. Don't know why they didn't use those. Uh, but the subsequent pages actually have quite a lot. Now I could just do this. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Because this should take us. Uh, nope, that last one is ink x n. Um, So there's actually going to be something in here. That's a direct page. Let's call that a D. But in fact, we're going to want to be cleverer than this. So Uh, we may not want to omit the parameter at the point where we uh, read it. So I'm actually going to do that to so say read a direct page value into parameter 1 and here we omit parameter 1. Because we could actually write this like this. 
I am making this up as I go along, by the way, can you tell? So the reason for doing it like that is because these, we are going to want to uh, copy one of the, we're going to copy a register into a parameter. Uh, but then follow another template from one of the other tables that's then going to need to refer to that parameter. And looking at these... Yep. Uh, yes, I was rambling. Uh, those... Let's just do that so it compiles. And let's take a look at the CPM version. Calgold doesn't yet have string commenting. So each of these empty strings will turn into a single terminating byte. So here are here are the strings, NOP, HALT, DI, EI, empty bytes. Unfortunately, the way initializers work means I can't just do this. And equally unfortunately, I... Uh, just thinking... Can I do this? Ah, right, no, you can't. Um, I was thinking of doing uh, something like this and then referring to unknown insan. Sorry, that would have to be like that for a array. Unfortunately, I haven't got around to doing that yet. So. I'm actually just going to uh, leave these all the same and just soak up the the hit. Uh, these have to be question marks because these are in the base page, so these will actually be printed. Um, in the extended page, I'm just going to use empty strings each of which will use up a byte. Uh, I should prioritize commenting out of strings. Unfortunately, to do that, you have to load all the strings into memory and keep them in memory so that you can compare them against any new string coming in. So it's actually quite expensive, but it's worth having. So we're going to need So here is an empty block of eight instructions. Okay, so we've done blocks zero and one. So we want to do two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F.
Okay, and that should build. Good. So it's not like we have, you know, very many, but uh, it turns out that the first instruction of the ROM is a DI. Oh, instruction 02, because that's where execution starts. So we can actually start, uh, start work. This is an extremely crude way of doing this, and hugely over-complex, but I think it's the simplest way of getting a result that's, you know, more or less correct. I'm sure it would be possible to uh, actually decode instructions according to the rules and collapse this all this code by quite a long way, but, you know, it's... Uh, difficult. Um, we also need a output buffer uh, to hold our output instruction, and I'm going to arbitrarily call that give that a size of twenty. So read instruction is output zero. So this is the routine that just writes something to the output buffer and advances the length. So if the thing we've read is a lowercase letter, just print it. Otherwise, we're doing something more complicated. And in fact, what we're going to do is Just error out. Uh, that's, that's the usual error you get if you miss semicolons. Okay. Right, we're actually doing quite a lot of the infrastructure. So after we have printed the hex, we actually want to print the uh, the disassembled instruction. So we make sure it's zero terminated and just print it. 
So, is this going to do anything useful? Yep, we have disassembled our first interaction. Correctly, too. Uh, now, 1A has failed because uh, it's just marked as unknown. For the time being, we are going to uh, yeah. we're going to check to see if the template string is empty. and error out. Right, so we actually fail at instruction 001 because 1a is not in the template. Or rather, we don't have a template for 1a. So, 8, 9, a, uh, 1, a is JPNN, so this is going to be uh, a simple address, which we then emit. So what is a parameter going to look like? It consists of actually let's have a quick scan to see how many parameters we could have. Here is an instruction with three parameters. We have the destination index register. We have the source index register, and we have the displacement. And if you look at the way the instruction is encoded, we have to read the destination first, then the displacement, then the source. In with this form, the source always goes la. Uh, ah, sorry, got that backwards again the source index register and displacement, and then the destination. The destination always goes last. But there are forms where the destination goes first. Like this one, for example. So, just thinking of the template byte, I actually am slightly changing my mind about the way these work. There are two things we can do. We can either write the parameter to the spec we can write a value to the specified parameter as we read it. And then when we write it, we emit you know a register via one of the various lookup tables or an address, depending on what type the parameter is. Uh, we would have to have a way to remember the type of the parameter. Or we can assume that parameters are just 16-bit values and have multiple writers depending on type. Which actually I think I prefer So we can have up to three parameters. Uh, 
hand, we are not going to track which one it is. The template is going to say, this is a direct page address. We're writing it to parameter, uh, parameter zero. And we are going to write that as No, actually, that's not a direct page address. That is a byte. We are reading a byte into parameter zero, and then we are writing a direct page address from parameter zero. And I'm going to put this over here to make it clear that this is the read phase, and then this afterwards is the write phase. So how is our JP going to look? We need to read a word into parameter zero. And we're going to write out a address. So this thing is going to be B or W, byte or word. And we're also going to have to have extractors for some of the various different types of register too. So let's go and actually implement that. So when it's a B, we're reading a byte. The thinking about there are some things that will just write out directly as well as lowercase letters so let's put these in here such as a space a comma open parenthesis Close parenthesis. I think that's everything. This means that if we reach this particular code path, the uh, then we know that we're we've got a uh, a byte that's going to do something, and these always take a parameter as index. So we read that. Yes, and actually I forgot that this should be uh, the, the at next keyword in Calgol advances a pointer to the next element. A pointer, if you add a value to a pointer, you're actually adding bytes. Uh, this is for a variety of reasons, one of which is to discourage people from using pointers too much because it's very expensive on uh, point arithmetic, it's very expensive on 8-bit machines. For example, if you, if you want to offset a certain distance into an array, you typically need to do a multiplication to uh, determine at runtime how much you want to skip. It's much cheaper to add uh, the size of the uh, the item. So we have next and prev. If you want to actually uh, jump around in a pointer, uh, jump around in an array by pointer, then you either use indexing or actual explicit multiplication. I think that made sense. Okay, we want to read a byte from the input stream. So that is very simple. read a byte, cast it to a UN16. This one we read a word, which is always going to be a UN16. 
we haven't done read words, let's implement that here. The TLCS90 is little Indian, so read the low byte. Read the high byte. So what's that gonna do? Bad template byte for one. Uh, A, address. We haven't done addresses. So we now need to emit using print byte here the, uh, this, the address of being referred to by the parameter. And in fact, I'm going to change my mind again Because we don't really care that this isn't that this value is an address, we just want to emit it as a 16-bit value. Uh, Sixteen bits. What, what character can I use for this? So we also have eight-bit values. I'm going to use n and m. I think no. So m for a 16-bit value, n for an 8-bit value. There's a reason for this, which is the the encodings here use n for an 8-bit value, and it's kind of arbitrary. So that's an m. We want to write out a 16-bit value, and we're actually going to steal a. Uh, well, I was going to say I was going to steal some code from the standard library, but it looks like the code in the standard library does not actually use uh, uh, UI2A because it uses a much cheaper routine for writing hex. But we have UI2A in the code. We've pulled it in in order to print decimal values, which we haven't done yet. Also, UI to A is a bit of a pain to use, so I'm actually, I am just going to steal. Uh, steal these. to me that this framework may actually be work may actually work for other architectures okay we have managed to disassemble 0793 here uh, this this jumped 0793 here which is correct that's where the rest of the code is you now this is a startup code for the system disable interrupts jump to where the main code is it's then followed by this chunk of ASCII, which is the type star 210, uh, some kind of version string. I don't know if it's ever actually printed. So this is going to disassemble as garbage, but we have to start at the beginning and go through to the end. So let's just have a look at 5.4. Oh, look, 5.4 is a nice, simple... Uh, instruction. So we can actually do the entire five band. So let me find it. Push BC. The 
actually the bottom few bits are the register and we're going to have to be able to decode these for this chunk down here so we could easily write the routine to pull the bottom a uh, couple of bits from the, the current byte stick that into a parameter and then the routine to uh, emit that parameter as a 16-bit register and then we would be able to use the same string for all of these and that would actually yeah let's do that so this is a 16-bit register which I'm going to call Q, so read Q0. Uh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. O means the current byte, that is B. So that just copies the current opcode byte into the register. Q is then going to be a emit byte, and well, that's going to do the masking there. So in fact, this so right now this is going to be duplicated in the binary. When I get by, when I get string commenting in, that will be so much better. Okay, byte word opcode very simple Q. So we need another table. which are the 16-bit registers. Uh, the encoding here, where is it? It calls them GG, so it's this table here. Uh, there's also a QQ, which is very similar. And uh, yes, it is. Yes, it's going to be this table. The difference is whether register 6 is the stack pointer or AF. In this case, it's the stack, po it's stack pointer. That's going to be BC, DE, HL, uh, oops, my screen recorder, IX, IY, SP, like so. Uh, these two question marks correspond to the holes at 3 and 7, which you can see here, 3 and 7. Uh, these are filled in down here by the NN and N constant forms, but we don't have to worry about them for now. So this, is, this has eight items in it. So all we do is So that just allows us to emit a string. So this is just going to print two registers, parameters, param, and seven. So that will pull a parameter. Uh, make sure it refers to, to discard any bits we don't care about. Look that up in the Q registers table and print it. 
and that doesn't work. Uh, expression was uint8. Ah. Firstly, that's an array. Secondly, the value of that is actually a uint16, but the Q registers index is a uint8. So, and this is actually referring to a error on a different line, probably there, because B is a byte. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> that's a compiler error. It can't compile this code on the 6502. I should go and investigate that. But for the time being, let me just turn off the 6502 toolchains. Um, yes. Okay. That's better. So now when we run the disassembler, it crashes. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It is an array of strings. It's assembled it correctly. Uh, compiled it correctly. I hope. Yeah, it starts at zero. Okay, so Q, the value being read out of Q registers is incorrect for some reason. It's not not a valid string. So is the value we're getting out of this wrong? Uh, as you int eight and uh, seven. That's found a seven byte. Which is an invalid register, it should it shouldn't crash. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. It should print that. Interesting. So is my print wrong? Read a byte, keep going round, print it. Should be nothing wrong there. So string is actually a uint8. So that is equivalent. 
So the values that are being stored in the array are actually pointers to strings. If we take a look at that CPM version again, we should be able to find... Here we go. Here are the strings. being emitted one at a time, and then following it is the array itself. So there's the last question mark. That 7f looks odd. But here is the array. Uh, oh no, that that's that's fine. Uh, the address is 067f, which in this file is 057f. So that's here. So that's actually the address of BC. Oh six eight two. Oh six eight five. Oh six eight eight. Oh six eight. A, yeah, something wrong there. So, what? Is it somehow overrunning the end of the buffer? Nope. Eight oh four nine B two three. And then B two three is not does not look like a uh, String to me, I mean CO2C7. I wonder if this is a code gen bug. So this is the code that the Calgol compiler has actually generated for this program. So One Q registers. I hope I remember to put a comment in. No, I didn't. Okay, so where is Q registers actually being referred to? Execute template. So this is the if statement here. This is this chunk of code. Here's the call to print byte. Now if we go look for print hex word, there we go, which means now we're here. The next thing is Q itself. Uh, so if it's not Q, jump away. Otherwise, ECX is going to be the address of Q registers. Yes, we dereference it. We call print. Uh, I wonder if ECX has been corrupted by something. Doesn't look like it. Uh, EAX is the actual offset. Hmm. I'm trying to remember whether this 38 on the 386 this 
uh, scales EAX automatically because it's a mov L. It could be the case, actually. Okay, well, there's one way to find out, which is instead of using the 386 version, we use this version. This version is uh, Calgol compiles into C, and then we compile the C. Okay, that fails as well. That's a good thing. That means it's probably not a uh, bug in the 386 code generator. That's very peculiar. So uh, we have got a value, but the value doesn't seem to be correct. I've used this idiom before in other code, so I don't see why this would be um, producing, in, you know, an invalid and in initialized array we can print the the address of the, the array itself So the pointer we've got is some way before the array. It's in fact too far before the array. Because the strings are emitted immediately after. I think they are in this 386 version. No, they're not. All the strings are packed together. by alignment. So all the one byte aligned things are emitted in chunk, then all the two byte aligned things, then all the four byte aligned things. You know what? I think I'm going to look into this offline because this is not the interesting part of the uh, of what I'm doing here. This is trying to track down a bug in my code somewhere else. So I will do that and jump cut. It is approximately 45 seconds later because I'm an idiot. Uh, my, print my print routine was wrong, it's just it was never stopping at the end of the string and just going on forever and until it crashed. Fantastic. Well, we have successfully disassembled this invalid uh, instruction. In fact, I'm going to change the into into this, just so we have a little bit more information. So the next byte is seven nine, which is seven. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And there's over here, isn't it? So what we are doing is we're adding a 16-bit value to HL. So this should be, I'll just go and look that up, but this should be, here we go, 79NM. Very simple. We've got all the stuff we need to do that. Uh, That's the whole 7, 8 block. What we are doing is we are reading a word under parameter 0. Add hl, comma, uh, uh, 
M0, 16-bit value. And it's just this this. seven times with different instructions. So add ABC sub SBC and or XOR and XOR or in fact that's only seven items because the last one is CP. I just happen to remember it's cut off in the end here. Okay. So that has disassembled this bogus instruction probably correctly. 73, that's this bank over here just on the left, which is, I think there should be a comma in there. This data sheet has got typos. And you'll notice that the ALU operations are always in the same order. Uh, that's direct page, so this needs to be like so. Uh, did we do D? I changed my mind about D and took it away. I'm going to put it back in again as a uh, this is you know actually it's, it's cheaper to do it this way so we've read the byte into the parameter now we or it with the base address of the direct page and write it out. And that doesn't work. Because that should be a word. Okay, we're getting a bit further. Uh, what I was what I was saying before I got sidetracked is the ALU operations appear in the same order in multiple places in the instruction set. Like you can see them, that they're here, they're here, they're here, they're here, uh, they're here, they're here, they're here, etc., etc. So, as a future optimization, we might just, you know, turn this into another uh, parameter. You know, just tell it to pull the bottom three bits out of the opcode uh, and print that as a step from the standard ALU operation table. And now I think about it, that's actually easy. Let's do that. Uh, like so. So write the opcode to parameter one, print parameter one as a ALU. Why am I doing this? Because it means that all these become the same, which means that when I eventually do my string collapsing, it'll be smaller. But now I need, of course, to implement L, which means I need to need another table. Add ADC sub SBC and XOR for CP. And we need to add support for the L printer. So this gave us ADC SBC sub. That ain't right.
Oh, <laughs> this O is, yeah. Uh, what we've just done is, in fact, we've uh, we're using the bottom few bits of the template byte rather than the value just read. So for that, that needs to be like this. But I'm also going to have to change this because we can't write the... If we use O here, we're actually going to pull the byte out of the the last byte read from the instruction stream, which is, of course, the uh, high byte of the 16-bit value. So we need to put that there. Uh, hang on, I've got myself muddled. Yes, I want to cut that and put it there. Bad template. Oh, that's a. Yeah, that doesn't mean the value zero, that means the. Yeah. That's because I managed to chop off the. W there. Okay, that's better. That is now actually working. So the next block is 3 1, which is this. This is copying a 8 bit constant into an 8 bit register. And again, for these, the uh, the destination register is encoded into the bottom three bits of the opcode. This is another standard table. This is the uh, the. R table, we're going to call it. So let's put in a of these. This is the same order that the uh, Z80 users, if I remember correctly so that the accumulator is actually the last 8-bit register, not, as you would expect, the first. So what are these going to look like? Well, we want to write the opcode to parameter 1. We want to read a byte into parameter 0. Let's just do that, that way around. It's then an LD followed by the destination register followed by N1, the payload. And this is, there's seven of them, not eight, because the last one is special. So we're going to leave that for the time being. So now we just need to implement R. I'm going to actually put this down here. Let's see. 
That doesn't work. Unexpected string line 93. No commas. Bad template character N. Oh yeah, that's the 8-bit value. I didn't do that. C comma thirties. So that's three one three zero three one L D C comma thirty. Yep, that looks correct. All right, the next block is two seven. Ah, that's 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 special, but not too special. That's just loading a value into A. And in fact, we can do these at the same time. Yeah, let's just do this one. Two seven is a direct page address. So read a byte a comma direct zero. Okay, that worked. 3, 7, right, it's our special one. That, that goes here, and I'm going to have to go look that one up in the detailed docs. Where are they? LDs are right at the top. So this is 3, 7. This is this form. which I'm a little bit confused by because that's got an R when I think it should have be an N. There's an N here. This will copy an 8-bit value into a uh, an address in direct page without going through a register, which is quite a nice feature, to be honest. So the first byte is the... Uh, the destination. The second byte is the payload. So it's a direct page destination followed by the payload. That would be here. 37CC00. Yep, that looks okay. Oh, by the way, uh, address 0010 is where the, uh, the software interrupt goes. Uh, one thing they did change from the Z80 is they got rid of all the reset instructions and it's just replaced with a single SWI instruction, which now I remember about it is here. That's it. Um, all that does is it does a... It, it's a reset to this address. But what that means is that this is all real code now, rather than mangled garbage when we try to disassemble text. So all this does is what is this? Oh, we start here. Yeah, we read whatever we read whatever is in this hardware register. We clear it to zero and we jump to the routine that actually does the work. And then we have another vector here, which is, it starts with a DI, so this is probably a um, interrupt handler, and then we jump to the routine that does the work. Oh, and look, the next byte is an FF, which is a SWI. That will be garbage padding. Yeah, lots of garbage padding. The it's both the Z80 and the TLCS90 uh, the bottom of memory is the um, it's the vector table for the interrupts and things. They're all eight bytes apart. So each one of these is turning the interrupts off and jumping to a routine at 3A9. So these will go on till we run out of vector table. Wow, we're getting quite a long way into it. Which looks about here. 
This is the same code we saw above. Oh, yeah, no, these are more interrupts. Okay, here we write. 8.0 is where things actually start. I think... I think this card's got kind of odd. Anyway, F8. Oh, F8. Ah. This is the first of our exotic pages. So each one of these, we need to copy the, the opcode into a parameter and then go visit a different page. Right, let's go find one of these in the wild. So I'm looking for an F8 as the first, well, anything from above F8. FE? FE? Really? That does not seem to match, honestly. That's not a reg ASP. Yeah, let's find another one. That may come back to bite us later. There we go, test. Uh, F8 plus G. So G is the uh, register number encoded into the bottom seven bits of the pr the uh, prefix byte, and then the other parameter is taken from the bottom seven bits of the suffix byte. Well, from our perspective, these are going to be straightforward. They're all going to be write the prefix byte into uh, a parameter. And then we are going to want to change template. And there are actually four banks, sorry, not change template, change bank. There are four of these banks. Uh. Oh, these ones are special. Okay, I was confused for a moment because there are four banks but five available slots, as it were. So if you include the base, then you've got this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. But actually, two of these share a bank. How does that make sense? So this is the one from F8 to FE. This is the one we're using now. This is EO to E7 and FO to F3. Ah, right. Yeah. These and these use, use one bank. These and these use another bank. So we've got the base, the source bank, the dest bank, and the reg bank. Right. Let's use their numbers. So I'm going to use T2 to mean it's switched to bank 2. And then here,
we are going to need another 256 entries So, oops, that, should, that should be there. Like this. And in fact, I did that wrong. I want to copy this once so I can put the one in place here and then duplicate this one six times. The reason for that is that it allows me to search for the number I need to change rapidly in Vim. Ah, also I need to copy more of them. Not seven times, I wanted 14 times. So we should have eight here, so another eight should do it. Okay, so we now need to implement the T modifier. Oh, uh, mm, have I got myself confused? Because, of course, we can't switch the other template until we've done all the operations for the instruction we want. Yeah, I, th I hope that's going to work. So in fact, what we need to do here is to so when we when we get a t byte, we need to be sure that we have finished reading all the prefix bytes. It's now time for the secondary opcode. So read the secondary opcode. Look it up in the. Uh, Look it up in the appropriate table. And then continue. So we'll switch to the template read from bank two and then continue processing bytes. Okay, so what's that going to do? Unimplemented template for byte 3f. So we have read the template byte and now we are. No, actually. Uh, what's happened is that we have read an empty, we've switched banks correctly, we've read an empty byte, an empty template, and we have terminated. So, in actuality, what we need is another error block 
narrow check block here. Like this. Okay, that worked. We have switched the bank to, we have tried to load the template for 6C, which is, it'll, it's one of these. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, wait, 6C. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. I was one of these. That's this side here. Uh, okay, I'll go look that up. That's that's and so. And. So those are the 16-bit ands. I want the 8-bit ands, which are here. F7, 6C. Yep, that's the right one. So this is no parameters. Uh, we read a single constant 8-bit byte, and then we emit that. So the uh, G here is parameter zero. For these, we're going to have to be pretty clear about the order in which the parameters, or I will just get confused. But we want to read a byte into parameter. No, we don't. We want to put the opcode into parameter one and the byte into parameter two, because this is an ALU operation. So it's the ALU operation based on one, six C, uh, and G comma N, right, we put, we want the G register based on parameter zero, followed by N two. I think that's correct. So this is the instruction we have just possibly passed. F eight six C three F. F8, G register is 0, which is B, so that is correct. 6C, 3F, good. And I just want to check to see what D down here, where we want bank 2, this one. Uh, yep, yeah, okay. So we've done this block here. All right, unimplemented template for byte EF. That's a base bank instruction, E, F. That's the one here, which I can't see. That will be dest N, so... Oh, actually, we're going to have to do the whole dest block. That's these. So in fact, these are going to be the same as here, except they are going to be going to a different block. Uh, the desk blocks go to, we were looking for the E8 bank, bank four.
Bag four seems to be largely empty, thankfully. Of course, uh, EF itself is special because it's the it takes a constant. So I'm going to have to find one. This was supposed to be a short video. I feel like this architecture is working pretty well, even though it's rather verbose in terms of code. Filling out the uh, the tables is going to be time consuming. But we are doing chunks at a time, which is nice. I'm looking for a... There must be one. EF. Here it is. Okay. So we have a single byte of prefix payload followed by the opcode, followed by a suffix byte. So first thing is to let's just copy this. This is going to be bank three, just to save time, because I know I'm going to need it later. Actually, once this is done, it's probably going to be worthwhile changing at least some of these into code. And this is bank four. Because some of the banks are very empty. This is one of them. However, we need to go all the way back up to bank zero, EF, this one here. Uh, we wish to, and I think I have managed to stuff myself. Because the parameters don't carry what they, information of what they are. So, I mean, here we need to read a byte's worth of parameter. But we can't tell the difference but the template can't tell the difference between this and this. Because we're going to need to use a different template to omit the instruction, depending whether it's an EF or a E8. Because the E8 is dereferencing a register, and the EF here is dereferencing a direct page value. But the way I've done this is there is that each of the tables for the banks is needs to use the same template. Now, I could get round this by using more banks. 
so that we have one template, one bank for the registers, one bank for the 16-bit values, one for the 8-bit values, and then one bank for the these three index dereferences, and yet another bank for this, but that's not going to work. So, I think the only possible thing to do is to change all these templates that I've done to a different model where the type of the parameter is set when it is written to the variable and then when it's emitted as part of the string we just say emit parameter whatever and then we have a generalized parameter emission routine that looks to see what type it is and does the right thing. Which is going to involve rewriting some code. Okay, I'm going to take a short break and be back and let's give that a go. Okay, so let's have a look at this. What can a parameter be? The obvious answer is a register. A constant value. A, well, a byte constant value. A word constant value. a condition code but I'm going to leave that for now because I have an idea or a index plus displacement so these are really tricky. The problem is that each of these actually has two different parameters. You've got the index register and the displacement. So in fact, uh, F0 to F7 have to, well, the exception of these two, have to write two parameters, one for the index register and one for the displacement. Well, these write one value. So the, the template that applies to any of the source for desks is going to have to be able to cope with parameters which are either a indirected register or an indirected index and displacement. So, yeah, so I'm going to have to have a normal register for uh, indirected via IX, indirected via IY, or indirected via SP or HLA but uh, for the same reason I'm not going to do stuff with registers and condition codes I'm going to ignore that for the time being so a parameter becomes the type, which is one of these constants, followed by either a 16-bit value or a
or a reference to a string. Uh, this at syntax here is Calgol's union type. Actually, that needs to go there. Uh, union type. It says that this parameter must be placed at offset zero from the beginning of the record. So value and text actually overlap each other. Uh, type here will come after both of them. So we still have three parameters. Now the reason for text is if we're dealing with a register, uh, we are going to look up the value and just stuff it directly into the stuff the string pointer directly into the parameter. This will make actually writing things out much easier. So uh, when you write a byte parameter, it will show up as a 8-bit constant. If you write a word parameter, it will show up as a 16-bit constant. These will show up as ix plus the displacement based in value. And I think that is all we need. So let's take a look at these, at these templates. So we're going to have to rewrite them all again. So ink x, that's this one. That takes a 8-bit constant. You no, know, it takes a direct page constant. So we're going to say, put the direct page value into parameter 0. Write parameter 0. What have we got here? Take a word, put in parameter 0, write parameter 0. This is another direct page. So I think this is actually going to make things easier. So this one, aha, aha. So this is these, sorry, 30, this, this block. We want to turn the bottom seven bits into a R register and put it in parameter zero. We then want to take a byte, put it in parameter one. So these become this. This last one is the direct page version. We want to read a direct page byte into parameter 0, read an ordinary byte into parameter 1, and output. Okay, this looks like it might be beginning to come together. For these, we want to read Q registers from the opcode into parameter 0, Yeah, Q and R will always have to read from the current byte. Things like D will have to read a new byte. This is the ALUOP one. So we want to load a ALUOP into parameter 0. This will be emitted. Actually, hang on. That will be emitted as text. We want to read a yeah, we want to read a word into parameter one. And it's the text in parameter zero, HL, comma one. And this is the same, but What are these? 7, 8. Oh, 16 bit values. Yep. So, ALU operation. Uh, 7, 0. These, hang on, that's wrong. We're not reading a word, we're reading a direct page address. Well, these, however, are reading a word. So, read ALU up into zero, read a word into 
one emit the ALU op HL comma one. Right. So we scroll down and we're now at E8. We are dealing with dest instructions. This is the one that floored us before. So we are reading a 16-bit value, a Q register from the opcode into parameter 0. And we are then switching to table, uh, what does E8 use? Table 4. Okay. For this last one, we are reading a Uh, oh, actually, we do this one as well. E3, so that's E8. This one. We are reading a word value into parameter 0. This one we're reading a direct page value into parameter 0. So the same table should therefore apply to all of those. Okay. Now we're on F8, we're on these register operations here. This is reading a pants. This is reading either an 8-bit R register or a 16-bit Q register. G register? Q register. And which one it is depends on whether it's a... Depends on the instruction. It changes the interpretation of the register. Oh, great. This means that we cannot decide what the register... What the actual string value is until we write it out. Uh, uh. Is there any kind of order to this? No, these are just jumbled. And these ones aren't even like registers. I was really hoping not to be able, not to have to decide but I was really hoping to be able to decide what they were at this point. Because I was hoping that when we read the register, uh, you know, like these, we would know when we read it that it was a Q register, so we look it up in the Q table and stick that string constant pointer into the parameter. But no. Okay. So we're going to have to have text byte word and we're going to need our registers and Q registers. So the, the R and Q modifiers that we came up with for here are still going to apply, that just instead of turning it into a text thing... No, no, that's, uh, that's doing the same thing again, isn't it? Uh, 
This needs to be an abstract register. I think we're going to have to do something pretty dubious. So these will still apply. That's just going to put a string constant into the parameter field. But when we come to these, we are going to we're going to use the a byte to say this is a abstract register, a value from 0 to 7. And then we're going to add a special modifier which will change the type of this parameter from an abstract register to a string constant which will then be invoked by one of these other templates. Uh, so this one, F8 block, is table 2. So it's actually going to be this. So what are the 6-8s? These, these ones. So we know that the G here is going to be a 8-bit register. So we simply say this is going to be the uh, yeah the low we want the low part of this register we call that six, eight bits and g comma n. Yeah, and we are then reading the ALU operation in from the current opcode into L1. That's not going to... Is that going to work? No, we want that to happen last. But we do need to read a byte into parameter 1. The ALU operation goes into parameter 2. We then write out parameter 2, which is the ALU operation. We then write out the destination, which is in parameter 0, that we have here converted to the appropriate register type. And then here we write out the source value. Yikes. So bank three templates, I believe, is empty. Bank four templates. There were some stuff in this somewhere. No, there weren't. Oh, yeah, I never got that far, did I? Okay, so now we need to change the state machine to do the appropriate thing. So, B read to byte. Uh, in fact, we can be a little bit cleverer here. So param is pointing at the correct parameter, or it'll be a hyperspace pointer if it's a T. So when we have a B, what we want to do is to say the type is the byte parameter, the value is one of these. W is exactly the same thing, but word, word. O is gone. D is a direct page, so this is actually going to turn into a word. Read. Uh, read byte 16 or with 
epic row. N and these have gone. Those, those are these are printers. What do we have? We've got Q read the Q register from the current byte. So So this is going to be text, and the text value is going to be Q registers current and seven. I think that will. I think that will work. We have R registers. And we have ALU operations. And we have abstract registers where the value is just the register value itself. remains unchanged. Does that build? No, it doesn't. 1.50. Ah. Okay, this will fail when I run it. Yep, because we haven't done any of the printers yet. And in fact, in fact, uh, this is now invalid because our printers, the like zero, one, and two are a single byte. That's fine, we can put that here. So I'm sure this could be more elegant, but uh, if it's a valid parameter number, then call this routine to print it. Otherwise, we go through this routine to load it. Right. So print parameter. So this should actually work. Uh, unimplemented template for byte six one. What we should have done? Oh, no, that should work. We should have done that one. Six one, six one, ADC A comma N. Did I break the template? It is now mostly templates. Six one is here. So I think what's happened is I've, I have a bad template and it's read the wrong number of bytes. So what is 7374? 
0, 1, 2, 3, SPC, SPC HL, comma, direct. Okay, that's... Okay. And what about this one? 7, 9, 7, wait, 7, 9, 7, 0, 7, 5, 7, 9. Yeah, that's a three byte instruction, all right. Four is five, four. Yeah, push IX. That also looks right. So I don't really know why this is failing now, but was working previously. Okay, well, let's do that print parameter routine. It should be fairly straightforward. yet figured out how to make Vim's control P autocomplete select an item on tab rather than return. And Okay, there's more, but I'm not going to touch them for now. That's not working. Print, print hex word, print hex byte. Oh. Right, well, that seems to be doing a thing. Did I implement this? I think I did implement that last time. That's direct page into A, which should be easy anyway. 6-1. So it's direct page into... Now hang on. LU operation to 0, direct page into 1, print 0, A comma 1. And that is yep, common throughout. Six one seven two. Yeah, and it's template for byte two zero. LD A comma B. Okay, so R register in zero, LDA comma zero. Q zero, LDA comma B, yep, that looks right. Uh, D31, three, two, Yep, D31, 30, D27, byte CC. This is definitely different disassembly than I was getting last time. So maybe it was just wrong last time. Five four. Is five four really push IX? Yes it is. Seven nine seven oh six five seven nine. Yes, that's a three byte instruction. We do indeed have three bytes. Okay, maybe it was just wrong last time. So, CC, right, we're going to have to do those condition codes, and that's going to need another table. Are the condition codes here the same as they are in the other tables? We've got F. LTLE, FLTLE, PNZNC, PNZNC. Right, let's do a table. FLTLE, ULE, PE. 
M Z C And if it looks like there's quite a lot of condition code, uh, then you'll be very pleased to hear, if you're a Z80 programmer, that this machine has signed and unsigned comparisons. Trying to do signed comparisons on the Z80 is a exercise in frustration. It's terrible. Not as bad as it is on the 8080, but it's a grim, grim business. There we go. So this is going to need a new modifier byte, which we're going to call C. And this takes the bottom four bits. So where were we? Uh, the C row of bank one. So all of these are going to be condition code into zero. Oh, and a displacement. I haven't done displacements. Uh, this machine has uh, single byte and double byte displacements, which is rather exciting. Uh, let's do a byte for now. Like so. So CC is CC37, C, C, yep, PO37. Uh, there should be a long form JR somewhere. Here we go, JP, long form. They use the same instruction, unlike the Z80. They're assuming that the uh, assembler is just going to do the right thing. And pick the appropriate form depending on the displacement, which as a compiler writer is lovely. Okay, C8 is special because this does not have a condition code. It's just the uh, it's wait, did I write JR? I'm sorry, what I just said was rubbish. Uh, for some reason I thought this was a JP. Right, that is less nice for a compiler writer, because I would much rather have the assembler take care of picking the appropriate form depending on where you're jumping to. And in fact, the assemblers I've done tend to do this. And yes, this is using. Yeah, you see, our real inst our real instructions started at one zero, but because we are we have different synchronization now for some reason, then it's it's not disassembling from one zero. We resync with the actual instruction set here at one eight. So the real code is down here in 8.3. Right, we haven't done that yet. So, this picks the low byte of the... Sorry, uh, yes, because this is pointing to the right, 
which is where the low bytes are, this is going to pick the 8-bit version of the register. And text equals, this is a R register. That's already been done for me, so that's all I need. Whereas this one is going to pick a Q register. Now, what has this done? Uh, this is the instruction that we were worried about, which is F86C3F, F8. Oh, and of course, this is okay. Right, that is the right register. Uh, boy, why are you there? That's a bad template. Bank two. We are here. These should be ones. Compare B with 3F. F8, 6C, 3F. So if we go up to the 8 bit section, look at the full documentation, here we go. Uh, F8, 6C. So this is this is reading a byte from after the the opcode. Six uh, C is not C P. Um, I think I put this all ah, right okay so L here has not does not read a byte from the stream so it's actually pulling a byte from here which is where the constant is so that's wrong uh, our instruction here which is f86 C should be Uh, F86D, where is 6C? Here we go, F86C3F. It should be an AND. So, we wish to read a byte So when we reach this template, we have read the opcode byte, which means L will refer to that. Then we read the byte of payload. And B, 3F. That's correct. Good. Right. Uh, template for byte. Actually, no. I know. Hang on. Let's, before we do that, let's start doing displacements. For displacement, we need to add on the current address, and we're going to need some more modifiers to load them. And we are slightly running out of memorable ones, so uh, so we're going to have J and P 
J for a short jump and P for a long one for I hope reasonably obvious reasons so these both take words these both produce words the value is the current address plus the displacement sign extended plus a constant the constant varies depending on where the uh, where the processor has its instruction pointer at the time when the addition is done and this can vary from processor to processor from the beginning of the instruction to the end to somewhere in the middle and I cannot remember what the Z80 does but it's likely not to be the same as this so 8-bit displacement we should there should be a comment here somewhere block transfer instructions And then we get onto hardware registers. Where are our jumps? I wish this table was in alphabetical order. Pause, test, shifts, test, here we go, jumps. just says PC plus D so maybe that's just the address okay so we want to take the value as a signed 8-bit uh, value we then extend this to be a unsigned 16-bit value and add it on to the address for P then we just add on the value. What this is doing here is it's sign extending the bottom 8 bits to be 16 bits wide. Now where, is our, where are our JRs? Instead of a byte this is going to be a J. We didn't read the byte, that's what we didn't do. Yeah, I was looking at uh, these ones when I cut and pasted those things. Three seven plus one one is four eight. So maybe that's right. Let's see if we can find another JR. Nope, we haven't met any yet. Uh, okay, now we're going to get on to byte twenty bank four, which is what bank four is this one? Two zero, we've got these. Uh So the source is the register is the R register baked into the secondary opcode. The destination is the thing that we stuffed into parameter zero. So if assuming everything works, this should be relatively straightforward. So we wish to uh, pull the R register out of R1 uh, yes and the the destination is always going to be indirect 
which means we don't have we know it's going to have to be a we don't have to do the same horrible thing we did with the angle brackets so the destination source i think that is all there is to it and we want seven of them so what's this going to do oh wait five LD, FFC, CC, comma, B. Uh, there aren't enough bytes in that. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh no, that's, that's, I think, right. E, F. Is this one destinations direct page? Therefore, the next byte is the direct page address, which is the same CC we keep seeing. And two zero is the opcode, which is store. Yeah, that that code makes sense. It's loaded the, the value at that hardware register. It's masked it. That's not right. Really. Uh, should that be a B? 27CC? 2, 7. No, that's an A. Okay, apparently that's right. Good. Is this actually working? Uh, byte A6, bank 2. This is bank 2. A6 is... Uh, F, E, D, C, B, A... A6, these are these bit operations. Um, I just realized I could simplify. We don't need this special reg type. We can use a byte for that. because these don't care what the actual type is and it allows us to use them here to get the bit number. So we want bank 2, uh, a black block, a6, oh that's actually these ones on the left, these are the shifts. I don't think we need a table for the shift instructions, or the roll instructions. Uh, no, we do, they're here as well. And you can only roll A's, apparently. Let me double check that. Uh, Sorry, you can roll registers. Yeah, you can roll lots of things. But they appear in different banks, which is why I'm not seeing them. Also, it's getting late and I'm getting slightly scraggly. So, table time. C R R R R of C R L R R S L A S L R S R A S L L S R L and yes we need another thing here for Roles and we've used R and we've used L. Have we used S? We have not used S.
Okay, so back to A6. And these are all identical. We need to read the uh, the shift type into parameter one, omit parameter one, omit the register. Is this bank two? No, this is bank three. <laughs> There are so many of these runs where all eight are the same that this will compress quite well into code. Okay, what did we get? F9A6. Uh... Oh yeah, this was the bank where we need to do the nasty shifty things. So, that needs to be like so. Right, F9, A6, SLLC, A6, SLL, and that is an 8-bit register, so C. Good. Byte 28, base bank. That's these? No, it's this one. Uh... I don't know what that is. I'm going to have to look it up. That's another special. Two eight. Here we go. Uh, load A into a register. And I'm getting my eight confused with my S. Yes, I'm getting tired. I probably need to uh, have another break, probably for the night. But this is actually getting somewhere. It's now mostly a matter of lots of data entry. So, uh, it's a R register, which is the destination, like this. We have seven of these, and then one of something else. Where is 2F? Here it is, 2FN. Like that. So 2.8 is LDB, array. Okay. Back to... Here, so F2, right, this is our first index. This is SP plus something, it's reading something from stack frame. Uh, and this is going to require more modifiers and actually dealing with the whole index stuff. So that actually seems like a good point to pause. So I will see you all in probably a few seconds. So it's the second day, I've loaded up my development environment, I've got the PDF open, let's get going. So we had stuck at F2, this is this block of source indexed operations. So we're going to need to add a parameter that turns one of these index operations into the appropriate type of register. And we're going to call that, of course, X. So... Uh, can we just check that X isn't already used? I've completely lost track of what modifiers we've got. No X's. Alright, so... To do this, it's... Uh, very simple. We load the bottom 
two bits of the opcode into parameter zero and then switch to one of the other templates. We, it is in fact, temp, for this one it's template three and for the F4 block is template four. So we simply have this four times and this four times. Now the implementation of the X modifier is going to not be as simple as I was thinking actually because yeah this is the, this was the thing I had I was talking about earlier uh yeah what we're gonna yeah so uh each of these indexed operations they really have two things we need to know which is the register and the displacement but our parameters can only store one value so we're going to use the value to store the displacement and then have four different parameter types for the four different parameters. Uh, we're going to treat HL plus A as one of these, even though it doesn't have a displacement. So we actually had only had three. So let's add another. And make sure they're in the right order. IX, IY, SP, HL, IX, IY, SP, HL. So... So what this is going to do is uh, we need to Create the register based on uh, create the parameter type based on the bottom two bits, but then we need to load a byte into the actual value, which of course will vary depending on the value. Uh, yeah, we can do that. It's, it's a little bit annoying, but. So, if parameter type is not HLA, like this, and let's actually put this up here. So, this takes the bottom two bits of the opcode. Uh, we add on parameters ix, which gives us the right type here. If it's not this one, then read an extra byte for the displacement. That should work. And we also need the code to print a uh, a value, print parameter. So that's going to be when param xix. like so, except that these uh, displacements are signed, so So that will print the sign and the value. So, next byte. 
that needs to be a int 8. Okay, so ix, iy, sp, and finally, this one is simpler, hl plus a. Uint a step. Okay. So what does that give us? Right, it's selected the appropriate bank, it's read the opcode, maybe correctly, but we haven't put the actual template there. So this is the five zeros of bank three. So that's these. That's going to be one of these. These are the EX instructions. So this is actually a Q register. Is it a Q register? Yes, it's a Q register in the opcode. So that will be Q1 EX0, 1. Uh, twice followed by a gap repeated. So what does this give us? EX SP plus 8, comma BC, F20850. So F012, it is indeed SP plus a offset, followed by 50 BC. That looks like that has disassembled correctly. Okay, back to the base page for 17. L D A R H L comma D D. That's an easy one. So the uh, hope it's an easy one. The L D A R instruction is a 16-bit load into H L using a displacement. So it gives you a relocatable code. And this is going to be I've forgotten what the displacement. Right is I don't actually want to put it down here. Uh, where is our displacement? Oh, J and P, of course. So for one seven, this will be H L comma. And this is a P displacement. Uh, that's not done what I expected. Should have been the current address plus the word. So current address should be nine six plus one b o o. Oh yeah, no, that is that is right. I was just uh, confused by b one and one b. Slight dyslexic moment there. Okay, we're now on to four two bank four. One two three four. It's this block here. Okay. So these are all uh, copying 16 bit registers. Again, it's a Q register in the bottom, followed by LD uh, one, LD zero, comma one. Uh, 
Interesting. Oh, yes. Uh, okay, well, for start, I, these need parentheses. And we also, yep. F six O six four two F Okay, its destination is SP plus constant and four zero one two is HL. Okay, that's correct. Uh, hopefully, we have all the template stuff working, so it should now be data entry from, from now on, which is possibly not terribly exciting to watch, but uh, if you're really lucky, I'll discover another major design flaw and have to rewrite it all from scratch. 3A. And um, as I'm implementing blocks at a time, eventually we'll run out of blocks. And we should have uh, coverage of the instructions that are used in this particular file. So these are loading a 16-bit constant into a Q register. So we need the opcode, we need a word, uh, load destinations to register, that's the word. But the last one, 3f, is special, that's a 16-bit thing, and we'll deal with that later. Okay, HL4000, 3a is... HL, good. 6F bank 4. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oh, ALU operations. Bank 4 has very little in it, actually. So that's this block here. Now, we have the destination parameter 0, the parameter 1 is going to be the opcode, which is an ALU operation, followed by a third parameter, which is the byte. So it is the opcode, followed by the destination, followed by the byte, eight times. And as this is a slightly complex instruction, let's go and check this against the detailed documentation. Where are my 8-bit operations? All right. So EFCC, here we go, EF, uh, yeah, EFCC, it's direct page, that's doing it right. 6F for the opcode, F0 for the payload. Yes, that is working, I'm slightly surprised. Uh, back to the base page for E6. Have I not done the source operations yet? Apparently I haven't. Okay, so these are the same as the destinations, but different. They go to a different page, that'll be page three. So it should be that simple, really. Q 
you register from into parameter zero except for the nn and n forms and then we go to page three and then we hit a missing template for block 70 this is page 370 is more ALU operations these are uh, destination HL source is uh, the destination well the source parameter so ALU thing uh, nope, that's it. So that's going to be the ALU operation. Uh, destination is HL source. Seven times. Uh, add HL, comma, SP, is that? E670. Well, 70 is add, that's correct. The prefix byte was E6. Yes, source is SP. Add HL, SP. Good. 4A bank 3. 4A. Uh, we'll load a indirected value and put it into a queue register so where is our bank three so queue register from the opcode uh, destination is the queue register followed by the source. Oops. So E24A just dereferences HL into HL. Let's check that's correct. 4A, destination is HL, E2, source is HL, good. Uh, this one it did for us, except that there's a. Yeah, the I didn't put the uh, parentheses in. Let me double check that one. Yep, destination parameter is dereference, therefore I need parentheses. SB plus 04 into, yep. Okay, and back to the base page. I strongly suspect that the way this is going to end up is that the base page, which is complicated, is going to contain, it's going to be a lookup table and the other pages are going to be code. Although now I look at this base page, it is much less complicated than it looks from the chart, so maybe not. Anyway, 9.6 is one of these. 9.6, these are increment a Q register. Uh, except for this one, which is special. So, really simple. Uh, no parenthesis. That should be just that. Seven times. Nine six, ink SP. Nine six, yep, that's right. Five E. Pop a uh, one of the registers that's not a Q register. Uh, 
we should have done pushers. Okay. Uh, this is wrong, actually, because these are not cues. But you know what? The only two places where AF is used in the entire chart, except for up here with EX, which is kind of special, is this push and this push and this pop. So let's just do that. And then here it's going to be the same. This means we don't need a chart for the registers which aren't Q registers. And much more importantly, I don't need to come up with a name for them. Five E pop AF five E right. One E is red. You don't get simpler than that. And I think this one is going to be ret I. So let's just put those both in. And in fact, now we're here, we might as well do these ones as well. I'll say that 0, 8, 9, A is EXX. No, these are EX, D, H, L, EX. AF, AF, dash, D, A, 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 decimal adjust. Maybe that's gone out of fashion these days now that uh, BCD is no longer used much. I have never used BCD myself. And I don't know what this one is. I think it's probably going to be deck and a uh, address, but I don't know whether it's a 16-bit or a 8-bit. So we'll come come on, we'll deal with that later. Right, actually got a lot further. Ink SP pop AF ret. Uh, and then lots of sway padding. F B L D I X O one F F. Yes, followed by a bad template char. Uh, yes, that may have hit one of these. And we actually want to, if we see a question mark, we actually want to print it. So that needs to be added to this list here. So we're at OFB. Okay, yep, that's a that's a zero five. It's this year. It is not a instruction. Followed by a SWI, followed by a very obvious jump table. a massive jump table followed by trampolines these look well BC is obviously the parameter to what's ever at 0080 I'm not going to start reverse engineering this right now So we're at 5e2 byte 1c. It's a call. And in fact, now we're here. 
I'm going to do that is a long relative jump it was using a 16-bit displacement we have an absolute call using a 16-bit address followed by a long relative call using a 16-bit displacement Bank four byte thirty seven zero one two three three seven is it's this okay yeah this was one of the instructions that uh, the these two actually which made me stop trying to reverse engineer the, the encoding because uh, these use the parameters the other way around to the rest of the instructions in this block. So the So these are these this block is for destination uh, instructions where the destination is supposed to be encoded into the prefix byte. Um, and in fact, looking at it, it's these ones which are wrong because in these, these the this source is encoded into the prefix byte. These ones are actually normal. Okay, bank four. So we need to read 16 bits from the instruction stream into a word, and then it's parameter 0, parameter 1. And I'm also going to do uh, hang on, I'm putting that in the wrong place. And let's go there. And this is similar but with a byte. Wait, three. S oh, okay. I was careless there. That actually goes there, and the other one is three F, three seven, three F. And that gives us a behemothic five byte instruction with a fixed 16 bit address and a eight bit payload yeah and that that looks like it makes sense all right we're at six four six byte a b bank two here is bank two uh, F E D C B A A B that's this block of bits so oh it's these again so the parameter is a 8-bit value so we do this Uh, here rather uh, we want to read the bottom three bits into parameter one which is a one followed by bit one zero Bit O three comma A, yeah, that that will uh, F E A B. 
a b is three. Uh, be nice to lose that zero, but I think I'm not going to worry about it for now. We could actually do it because a is only ever used to convert a value to a register using an angle bracket or to print a 7-bit value so we can actually distinguish but yeah I'm not going to worry about that for now 652 uh, byte bb base page bb more bit operations this one is set with an indirect through direct page now these three blocks are interesting because these give you a two byte operation that will uh, manipulate anything in the direct page. This is obviously for tinkering with hardware registers and, and hardware peripherals. So they were obviously thinking that this was going to be uh, a heavily embedded system that did a lot of hardware control. Because in most code you don't touch peripherals very much. You tend to have a library that uh, controls them. So they were obviously expecting there to be lots of peripheral control code and this would save space or possibly performance. Anyway, B block BB is going to be 8-bit uh, constant for the direct page. So put the bit number into parameter 0 direct page value into parameter 1 like so so bbe6 set bit 3 at this address looks plausible 3f right it's that one let's go look at the detailed doc Wait a minute, 3F. That seems familiar. Oh, in one of the other pages it's familiar. So let's look at the detailed documentation for it. Here it is. Load a 16-bit value into a direct page indirection with the LDW opcode. Oh, yeah, uh, it's very similar to this one. So, d0 for the direct page, a word into parameter 1, ldw, 0, 1. And the reason why it's ldw is because the, the assembler cannot tell whether you meant this instruction for an 8-bit constant or this instruction for a 16-bit constant. If you had a, if you were supplying a register as well, that would be easy. Here it is. Okay, it's plausible. Byte six e. Add a eight bit constant to a. Uh, ALU operation from the current byte, 16 bit, 6e, yep, 8, 8 bit constant to parameter 0, print the ALU operation, a comma uh, 1, 7 times. And that was this one, I think, or 30, which 6e, or that seems to have worked. Code, 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 uh, 68b, byte 48, that's this one, whatever that is. That's probably, looking at the other instructions, writing hl to a absolute address, so... Check the detailed docs. 4f, here we go. No, 48, sorry. Uh, 
Would that be writing a... Hmm. Four, eight. Ah, it's the move HL to a 16-bit register. That'd be a Q register. So that's actually going to be same as up here, but the other way around. So Q register to parameter 0. Wait, that's all there is. So ND like that. Except for the last one. Four eight. EC comma HL, okay, four four. Uh, and that's the other way around. Um, but there are gaps, actually. I shouldn't. So four O is Q register into parameter zero, followed by that. Oops. That's interesting. Isn't there a isn't there a way to copy BC directly? Uh, copy. Hang on. HL into BC. IX into HL. Okay, yeah, it does need two copies. 4 3. Really? 4 3? That's a bad opcode. That looks like a actual instruction stream. I mean, that makes sense. Uh, no, hang on, hang on. This is and this is ASCII. Z that's a zero, that's a space. Yeah. Okay, this this is garbage. Uh this is the end of the actual code when we jump off to whatever's at five B six. And then this is a string. So just for my sanity, Just do this uh, print char. So this will I need a space there. I mean, nothing's lined up, but it will print the uh, the ASCII codes next to the instructions. So. Here we go. 
VHD check. Uh, I bet that's going to be VHD check, and this is a string produced by some kind of self-test routine, which means that uh, once I've located the string in the ROM, I can reverse engineer it, find out where the string is printed from, and try and figure out how to make the typewriter actually run that bit of code. But before we do that, we have to go to 4B here. That should be there. Yep. VHD check followed by. Oh, in fact, here, you see, this is loading the constant value 0688 into IX, which is the address of our string. Uh, I bet that this is going to be the length. 10 bytes, well, 16 bytes rather, so that's hex. 1, 2, 3, 4, wait a minute. 688, 698, yeah, 16 bytes. So I bet that this routine is actually going to print it somewhere. 5b6, uh, which it's not disassembling because it got desynchronized somewhere, which is a shame anyway. Where are we now? We're all the way up at 0712. We're actually getting through this. Uh, bank 3, byte 2e. Two 2e. Two uh, Dereference whatever it is and put the result into an 8-bit register. So, 8-bit register, so we do the thing. Do we need to do the thing for this bank? It looks like we don't. Let's not do the thing. I'm not even sure that the thing would work if on the wrong parameter type. It'd probably just be garbage. Uh, but we want to... The destination is a R register from the opcode and to R1, so 1, 0, 7 times, or 8 times. Indeed, here E three O D F A. Uh, let me just be paranoid and check the docs. We're looking for L D A comma N N. No, we're not. We're looking for this one. No, we're not. We're looking for this one. E3. Yep. ODFA is a 16-bit address, followed by the encoded register. Okay, that's cool. Uh, 62 bank 3. We are in bank 3, so 62 is this block. ALU operations from the source parameter into A. So ALU, print the ALU thing, A comma zero, eight times. Yep, that looks plausible. 
you see that both of these have the same uh, basic, the same prefix byte. So we don't know whether it's an LD or a sub until we read the last opcode at the end of the operation. Which is not something I've seen in an instruction set before. This is quite weird. There is a logic to it and a certain amount of elegance, but it not it's unusual. Right, bank to DF bank to uh, F E D okay, these are re return via a uh, condition code. And there's a note here to say that the prefix byte must be FE, but actually I am not going to worry about that. But what we need to do is read a condition code, which I believe is in C, into the parameter, into parameter 1, and then it's just ret 1. Eight, well, six, 16 times. And let's put these in the right place. You may have realized that the reason why there we go. So this is comparing A with constant ten and returning if the carry flag is not set. DF is this one, RETNC. Uh, so that's actually doing a, a unsigned magnitude comparison. It's, it's, it's subtracting OA from A, and if the carry flag wasn't set, then we do the return, and it won't be set if 10 is less than or equal to a, I think. Yeah, the, now the reason why I'm doing each instruction as we find it in this file is because this makes it much easier to test. I could just start from the top of the data of the data sheet and just work through them. But uh, also that would be much less interesting to do. Okay, we're still on bank two. Six two zero one two zero one two three four five six six two ALU operation with a uh, eight bit register and this is the block where we have to do the things there are GGs here into A So do the thing ALU operation into into one and that's all we need. It's a comma zero seven times. Sub A comma B. And on the Z80, this will be a one-byte instruction. I don't know what the code density of this thing is. It's got way more useful registers, uh, way more useful instructions. But a lot of the things that on the Z80 were one byte are now multiple bytes. So, so, bank four byte C zero. Bank four C zero. Ah, conditional jumps to A uh, via a register. Uh, 
Yeah. Which was something Z80 wasn't very good at. Where are we? Bank? We are on bank four. So this is, we take the condition code, parameter one, JP condition code, destination. Yeah, and this is using the uh, the addressing mode where you give it a 16-bit value. So, yes, you can use these for going to a 16-bit constant address or jump to a address in a register, which is cool. And since we're here, and because it's almost exactly the same, I'm going to do the calls as well. Okay, so we've done both of those blocks. Byte 19 in the base page. Technically 1-9 because it's hex. That's this. DJNZ, yeah. Uh, again, a nice thing that this thing had, which the Z80 didn't. The Z80 only had the basic DJNZ, which is decrement B and jump if non-zero. Very useful for loops. This one has a, this machine has a 16-bit form. So these two instructions, we might as well do them both. It's a 16-bit uh, jump, JNZ0, JNZ BC, comma 0. Here we go. Two bytes for a complete loop. Very nice. And then lots more instructions. This looks like main code. Wait a minute, where do we jump to on startup? It is the main code. We go to 0793. Yeah. This is the main routine that runs the entire typewriter. Turn interrupts off. They're already off, but never mind. Uh, set the stack. Well, this tells us where we have some RAM. And I believe... Yeah, this is part of the built-in RAM on the system, I think. And then we've got all these routines to do things, to set things up. Poke a hardware register. No idea what that is, but that looks like a built-in TLCS90 hardware register. So I can look that up in the data sheet. Do things. And here we have a loop. We jump back to 07C2. That's halfway through this instruction, which makes me think, yeah, these are all... Ew. Ew. Uh, these are all one byte out because this is obviously trying to jump to either here or here. Jumping to the next instruction is obviously wrong therefore we have an off by one error in the 8-bit displacement. It's this one. So I'm just going to stick a plus one on that. So now, 
Ooh. That's still wrong. So O seven C three is halfway through this instruction. So what's this loop doing? Okay, this is now pointing at an actual instruction. So this piece of code here is the main loop for the entire typewriter. So we have all the setup, and then we just go around here doing things. Uh, this is so what we're doing here. We load de with a value. Then we check the thing at this address, and if it is not zero, we change DE to this other value. Uh, this is a very simple, it, this is a very common idiom for if this is zero, set DE to this, otherwise set it to this. Uh, uh, except that. Well, no, we're also calling this subroutines. That's not quite right. Yeah, but anyway, we are doing the thing here. We are doing a thing based on the contents of this this memory location, and either calling this routine with DE set to 70E or this routine with DE set to 0806, which is interesting. The what's at 0260. Push BC, set BC to 1, jump to 0080. And this is, this will be a standard routine that does something. Uh, it's not immediately obvious. But anyway, let's go down to the bottom and see where we are. We've gone off the bottom of our main loop. We have padding and we have a unimplemented opcode, 9F base page this uh, that will be deck something so let's go find deck ink deck 9f here we go decrease the value in a direct page memory location uh, direct page memory location deck zero and the other decks are a Q register okay that looks extremely suspicious as code so I think this is garbage but it is at least disassembling. Okay, 812, uh, byte80, this block here, oh, this is exactly the same, but for inks. So, uh, hang on, hang on, have I got that wrong? Nine zero. What was the thing I just did? Nine eight, wasn't it? Uh, yes, okay. We're here, we're decking a Q register, a 16 bit value. Now we are inking a R register, an 8-bit value. Okay, that's straightforward. And this last one, which I might as well do, is a direct page, D0, ink, not. So 
So eight zero in B. So this takes us all the way down to five F. Six bank two. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, six. This block we are adding a Q register to HL. Well, with, with an ALU operation of a Q register against HL. So it's a. It's in fact the same as this block here, but with a Q, a Q register rather than an R register. And HL. FA76 or HL with HL. That looks, looks plausible. Back to the base page, 4, 7. Uh, that I think is writing four seven. This one is writing a uh, it's reading a sixteen bit value out of direct page into HL. Bank to byte five nine zero one two three four five five nine ah right this is another case like the the rets where the prefix byte should be fe so these are the uh, the block operation instructions that Z80 users will know and tolerate. They mostly look really useful, but only a few actually get used in real life. Uh, so the LDI, LDD, CPI, CPD, they do a thing uh, and then increment a in uh, a spe specified register so the ld will copy from either hl to bc uh, hl to de or DT, de to hl i can never remember which way around they are uh, it will then increment hl and de and decrement bc bc is a loop counter this will do the same but it will decrement hl and de's so this will do one element of a copy. This will do one element of a copy in the reverse direction. These two are exactly the same, but they do com compares and leave the flag set. The R suffixed versions will then repeat the operation until BC is zero, or I believe for the, cop the compare until the appropriate flags are set. I have never found a use for these. I think you may be able to do mem copy, uh, mem comp with them. Uh, there are also on the Z80 equivalent instructions that will repeatedly read from an I/O port, but they don't do any synchronization. So you don't know whether the hardware device is going to be ready for another read. So again, I've never found a use for them. And it looks like this machine has just left them out. Anyway, 0876. Uh, oh, haven't saved. LDIR. Yeah, here we go. This is a, this is the most common use of these. What this is doing is it's copying eight bytes from either here or here to either here or here. I think DE is the destination, actually. 
Yeah. So where are we now? Bank three A B A B more bit operations. Am I in the right bank? I don't see any other bit operations. I'm sure I've done some. I've done these. Okay, A8. So the source is in zero. Put the bit number in one. And these two are the same, but different. So let's do those as well. One bit. Uh, Test bit three of this address looks odd, but the instructions do seem to sync up. Let me just double check that. Here we go. Uh, bit three of F9FB, that's this one. Oh no, that that's correct. That's correct. I was getting confused about where the payload was. Anyway, we're at eight B three base page, which is down here. Four F. This one. This will be the sixteen bit version. No, this will be the. This will be this, but in the other direction. But I'm still going to look it up in the detailed docs. Uh, direct page destination HL source. Yeah, it's the same as. Yeah, it is, it is indeed the same as this, but in the other direction. Okay, instructions, 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 951, base page AC. Bit operations! Now the bit operations are great because I can do huge, great swathes of them at once. So in fact, I've already done set, so... T1, this one is res. So interestingly, the, the res and set instructions take the destination as the second parameter, where the rest of the mnemonics destination is usually the first parameter. Mm-hmm. Uh, bank three eight seven. Bank three eight seven. Ink a indirected thing. So 
that is just this. Which means that this is going to be this. And these two are going to be ink word and deck word. So being able to increment a value at an address and a 16-bit value at an address is quite nice. Wait a minute, doesn't the Z80 let you do that? Hmm. Where have we got to? BB4. Uh, Bank two three eight. We that's this bank three zero one two three eight. Copy a sixteen bit Q register into another register. Yeah, you can copy any sixteen bit register into any sixteen bit register, including IX and IY, which is really nice. But it takes two bytes to do so, unless you are copying in and out of HL. So HL now really is the 16-bit accumulator. Everything is faster in HL. Anyway, bank two, three eight is Q register in the opcode. Uh, LD one comma zero That is not right. Right, that's because we haven't done the thing. This is a Q register. Now this is a sixteen bit operation, so we need to set this to be a register. Here we go. LD, BC, D, E. Good. Lots of code. Lots of big instructions. Four bytes. I did a 8086 backend for CalGoal the other day. Wow, that instruction encoding. It's so special. Byte BC Bank O2 F E D C B B C Oh more bit operations excellent These are the ones that operate on registers. So set bit four of A. That's interesting. Is there a or a comma n option in the base page. Yes, there is. So they could have done exactly the same thing by simply oring a with uh, 16. And that would have produced precisely the same effect in two bytes. Yeah. Okay, uh, still in bank two, three, five. Hang on, this is bank two, three, five, three, zero, one, two, three, three. Okay, moving 16 bit registers. So that's the same as the ones on the other side, except with the. Uh, Yep. 
but using 16-bit, 8-bit uh, registers, even. Okay, that looks good. C1, base page again, it's uh, one, four, it's one of these. Right. Um, right, I'm just checking to make sure that these line up with the other index register forms, which they do. So, sorry, the other Q register forms. So we can use Q register decoding for these three. Let's go find them. So there's one, four, zero, one, two, three, four. So Q register from the opcode. A word from this construction stream, add zero comma one. So add five to ix. And uh, now you should be able to do this using one of these forms. Here we go. Uh, no, no, we want a I'm looking for a add gg comma x. I don't see one. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, I'd forgotten this. Uh, HL is the 16-bit accumulator, so most 16-bit ALU operations will only work on HL. So here they are. We have uh, add HL, comma GG, which adds a... Sorry, I'm not looking for GG, I'm looking for NN. Oh yeah, but this is uh, yes. This works because if it's an NN, then it will actually happen through the prefix byte. So this is the right instruction. So you can add a 16-bit constant to HL by doing presumably F E for the prefix followed by your 16-bit value, followed by 7-0 for add HL, GG. Uh, but if you're adding a 16-bit value to IX, IY, or SP, we have an abbreviated, we have uh, this abbreviated form in the base page. So it's interesting that adding a value to, to IX is cheaper than to HL. Yeah, anyway. Um, bank three, byte eighteen. One eight. T set. What is T set? It looks like a bit operation, but. Oh, it's test with a typo. <laughs> okay, okay. I should say there were typos in this. Yeah. So 
So, uh, find that page. Right, we do need the thing. Then we need to extract the bit. Then it is like so. I have a bit of a feeling of, I am in fact looking at the wrong uh, page of the datasheet. So I don't need this, but I do need this. Okay. Where have we got to now? One, two, two, six. Base page byte thirteen. Right, this is multiply and divide HL by a eight bit value. Oh, and we have a couple of trivial instructions we can put in. Complement A negate A. So this is straightforward. It's a byte value followed by that. It's a shame it's only they're only eight bit uh, multiply and divide units because that makes an enormous difference. But even just having eight bit divide in hardware is nice. Look, you can divide by three in two bytes. Bank two by uh, one, four, one, four, right. So these are actually very similar to these, but using a different addressing mode. So how is this working? We have the source value in a register. Okay, so we need to say that these are 8-bit registers while these are 16-bit registers. We are now done for multiply and divide. For add, we are also done. No, we're not. We need this. The destination comes from the, the Q register in the actual opcode, while the source comes from the uh, the prefix byte. I think that's correct. So F eight one four one four is add IX, comma BC. Good. If I see five, you notice we're at 
we're moving through the file in bigger and bigger chunks. When we reach the end, I will then go through the uh, the data sheet and fill in the remaining opcodes and just kind of hope they're right. Base page 8F. 8F, that's a whatever that is. Uh, that will be decrementing direct page 8-bit value. Yeah, we've already done this, so we might as well do the rest. So R naught deck naught. This one becomes like so. And then the next row down is the same but with 16 bit values. And this is still direct page, so that's D naught ink work zero. And this should actually be Dequa zero because it's a 16 bit thing. So here we go, decrementing the thing in direct page address two. Let's see, two eight. Bank three. Byte 12, one. Ah! Look what I found. It's exactly the same things that we had before, but in a different addressing mode. So multiply and divide. Uh, we don't need to do the thing, so all we need to do is emit the instruction. Multiply HL by source. Divide HL by source. Uh, we need ALU, oper no, not ALU operation. Q register into one. Add destination register source. So multiplying HL by the thing at FB41 looks plausible. We clearly haven't desynced. Base page A4 A0. Oh. Uh, shift 8 bit shifts by A. You saw these in another page. Yeah. It's the same as these. Did we make a table for that? Yes, rollups. Which is S for shift. Good. So these should all be that. A4 SLA A A zero one two three four SLA A good. Where where are we now? D six uh, the entire D block is junk. That's actually kind of surprising. Does this look like code? No, it doesn't. This is garbage. It's a data table. Rank three byte A five A shifts. So the value is in parameter 0, so load the shift into parameter 1, hit the shift, yeah. And 
SRA F94 E. Yes, that looks that looks like code again. Uh, base page 5F is garbage. In fact, all these holes are garbage in page in this row, so we can just do that. Bank byte four, bank four. Okay, I wondered when this was going to happen. Uh, this entire row is garbage. In fact, bank 4 has very few real instructions in it. So we just happen to have hit a prefix byte for this bank. Uh, and then the, it's tried to decode the prefix according to whatever rules there are. And then the actual opcode turned out to be, well, garbage. Uh, So once this, once I have added all the real opcodes, what I'm going to do is go through and take out all those question marks and make them empty strings and then change the rules in the decoder so that if it sees an empty string, it just prints a question mark and stops. Because I don't want to fill question marks in all of these. So for now, I'm just going to stick the appropriate question mark there just so that we can get further on in the file. There we go, this is the one. Because that allows us to proceed. This is all data table. So I bet this is going to be the same. Well, not actually. 2D. 0, 1, 2. Yeah, these are all garbage. F, E, D. Lots of progress. Byte 2, bank 4. I don't want to put question marks everywhere just yet, or even at all, because uh, I still want it to error out at unimplemented templates. 4057. Uh, byte 1, bank 4. Although I might just I know that this row is junk, so let's just do that. Eight five bank four zero one two three four five six. Yep, nothing there. Actually, hang on a second. So we've got this block of two zero. We've got this block here from three. Okay, we haven't done three eight. The, the, these instructions here. Uh, ah, I didn't actually fill in the. is this looks like code again five three nine bank four okay right now we are here so that, that's this one this is the destination is a Q register That's LD one comma zero, except for B, which is garbage. Uh, 
and that's this then. Uh, I don't like that. 39D, comma, X. Wait a minute. Is that a dereference? Yes, it is. There should be parentheses around that. But in most places, I am writing the parentheses as part of the template. But that's a that's one of our special indexed operations. That's one of these. Uh, F7, it's uh, this one. So... That's... That is bank four. So is this a typo and there should be parentheses around that? Let's look at the other, let's look at the detailed docs. Uh, we are F739, so go F7, no that's not it. Uh, F348, F7, three, F, Uh, that's very strange. I would expect to see an F zero. No. See, these are the eight bit forms, and these are the sixteen bit forms, and this is clearly a sixteen bit form. I'm looking for instruction that's got RR on the left. So that's one of these. But the the F seven prefix byte is it's a bank for operation. So it should be that's the one that it calls dest. So the prefix byte is mostly encoding the destination except for exceptions. I think this is one, yeah, see here is F7 with HL plus A as dereferenced on the left. Uh, I've got that template wrong. F739 is this. But the but 
the 3.8 block uh, is mostly encoding the destination register. That appears in the secondary opcode rather than the prefix byte. So that is why we have Q1 LD1. So what we've got here is that the prefix byte is encoding an index operation, but then we're using it with the wrong operation. So the 38 opcode even when it appears after a prefix byte, doesn't do a dereference. It just copies a register to another register or a register to wherever. But we're using it with the... Yeah, I am thoroughly confused by this. I wonder if this is even a valid opcode. You see, if it was trying to dereference HL plus A and put the result in DE, then it would be using this form with an F3 prefix byte, not an F7. And it would also be using a different... Uh, well, it's, it's coming from a different bank, so it's completely different instruction. With F7, I would expect the destination to be indirected through HL plus A. Okay, let's take a, let's just double check the big table. Right, F7. Destination dereferenced HL plus A. So it is. It's this prefix byte here. Uh, index thing on the left, switch to template bank four. And now we are here. And this is an instruction that should work on registers. Yeah, I do not know what's going on there. It might be an invalid opcode. It might be a completely valid way of saying add A to HL and put the result in DE. Uh, I don't think there's... Either I'm missing something completely, which is frankly plausible, or uh, this data sheet is incomplete. So I'm just going to stick with this, and then I think that when I actually get things running on the real machine, I will have to try it and see. Anyway, where are we? 4621. Bank 2. Byte 8, 9. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 is garbage. D0. We are over a quarter way through. Bank 3 byte FD is garbage. Bank 3 byte 09 is garbage. Byte 
08 is garbage. And in fact, you know what I said earlier? That's nonsense, I can always change things. So let's just fill these out with question marks. We know that this row is garbage. Uh, we know that these are garbage. We know that this is garbage. These are not garbage because these are T-set instructions. But we know that all of row two zero is garbage. So five, six, eight, two, bank four, OD. That entire row is garbage. So is the next one. So is this. Here it's zero, one, two, eight. We know that uh, that's wrong because that's actually referring to this hole here. I was misled by the way that there are actually nine instructions here and seven instructions here. Uh, zero, one, two, three, three, zero is. Oops, Garbage down to there. Three eight, that one is garbage. Four zero, these two are garbage. All of four eight is garbage. Uh, zero, one, two, three, four. Yep, all of five oh and five eight are garbage. Six O is all garbage. All of these are garbage, garbage everywhere. In fact, I'll do this just to make my file a bit shorter so that scrolling up and down doesn't take as long. In fact, it's all garbage from here on out. Nine A B C nine nine A A B B C C Nope, C's not garbage. Okay. Sixty two. Alright, that gets us to five eight FO Bank three byte. Two, what do you reckon? That's garbage. This is bank two. Bank three bytes two is still garbage. Wait a minute. No. Oh. Bank three byte two. This is all garbage. Okay, we are continuing. I do wonder just how much code a typewriter has anyway. There's there's going to be two major bits of functionality, one of which is to compute the bitmaps that need to be sent to the printer. Uh, the toll 256k ROM is, I suspect, nearly all font data. The other part of the functionality is the user interface. There is, in fact, a text editor which will run on the little 16-bit, 16-character display, which requires, like, that will require work. But it's a character cell display. It won't be that much work. Right, I don't know what that is. That's a deck of some description, but it's been clipped.
So we're looking for deck OF. Uh, Here we go. Deck X. Okay, Ink X and Deck X are strange. X is a flag, which is set under some circumstances, but I'm not sure what. I think that this is a flag used for um, possibly sign extension. I haven't quite pinned down where it's computed. Admittedly, I haven't looked very hard, but it's what it does is these two instructions. If X is set, then increment or decrement the value. Leaves the thing in the that, that address. Otherwise, do nothing. So it's clearly an adjustment after some kind of operation. Maybe it is a instruction that allows you to. Uh, oh, I already did, did that. Uh, that allows you to do multi-byte arithmetic cheaply. Like if you if you're adding a 8-bit value to a 16-bit value, then you add the bottom byte, but then you have to add zero to the top byte and include carry. So maybe you can use this instead uh, to just uh, add either zero or one to the top byte, depending whether you need the carry or not. But then why would it be called X? I will have to look into that later. There, it's clearly garbage. Bad template char quote. Ooh. Okay. So quote is obviously a printable character. Five V four A. What this does is it swaps AF with the shadow copies of AF. This machine does have shadow registers just like the Z80. This is the only place where a single quote is used in the entire instruction set. Five V seven F. Bank three byte nine eight nine eight. Oh, it's a real thing. So eight seven. 8F, 979F. Uh, oh, I've already got one here. Um, I've done 80 and 80. Wait a minute. Sorry, 98. That's this one. That's garbage. But let's fill all of these in as garbage. Nine eight bank two is garbage. In fact, all of those two rows can be eliminated. Got us to five B C nine Bank four FF. Hey, what do you reckon? 
Don't think anybody was expecting that one to be garbage. I think, I mean, this is obviously clearly not code. Uh, we may have actually run out of code, and it's data tables from here on out. Uh, bank 2, byte 4, 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, that whole row is garbage. So is five O. Six eight bank three C four garbage. And again, everything from CO down. Lots of progress. 6BF, uh, 6BF4. Um, I search for the last address before quitting less so that I can use the history to find it again the next time round. Uh, bank 337. 37. The whole 3O range is garbage. Back so is four O. Not a lot there. Okay, we are now over halfway through, and very suddenly, starting at the sixteen K mark, we have code. Now, this machine has 8K of RAM. I... Which is that code? No, that's not code. This is, this is garbage. That makes no sense as instructions. So this machine has six, uh, 8K of RAM, and I don't know where it's mapped. Uh, I could make a guess based on things like where it sets the stack pointer on startup, and where its variables are, but... Uh, I know the I know the CPU has some internal RAM as well, so it might be using that for those. But clearly, something has started here. Anyway, eight O B six, bank three, byte two six, three two six. It's all garbage. Okay, scrolling down, B, C, we're three quarters of the way through, and then it stops. But it still doesn't look like code. Uh, bank 3, byte 1, 0, that is a instruction, a first one for a while. 
R L D a uh, roll double. I mean it's. Let me have a look at the docs. R L D. Uh. Yeah, yeah, it's a sixteen-bit roll. Nice. Wait. Wait. Uh. Oh, this is rolling by four bits. Uh. This goes to this. This goes to this. This goes here. And this is unmodified? Is that a 12-bit roll from A to memory? I think it is. Uh... I don't know what to make of that. That's very strange. It must be useful for something. Uh, C303. CD48. This actually does look like code. Uh, it does look like code again. Good. Uh, byte one eight bank two. One eight. Uh, it's our old friend T set again. Wait one. This is bank three. Uh, that means that these two instructions I just put in shouldn't be there. They should be in bank two. And these should be question marks. No, no, no. no. Uh, Alright, 1 8 bank two. I need to look at bank two. I thought I was looking at the. Uh, never mind. One eight Right, these are indeed our old friend T set. So this is a eight bit value. Uh, just do that. It's a eight bit register. The bit number is in the bottom is is in the secondary opcode. Okay. C D four eight. F nine one eight test zero zero comma C. Yep. Where are we now? D D six two five. Uh, byte E3, bank 2. This is bank 2. Uh, the whole E block is garbage. Back E and F are garbage. That's the wrong address. Oh, what's happened? Hey, we reached the end of the 64k address space in the ROM, and now we start disassembling the rest of the ROM. 
which is going to be complete garbage because you, on this machine you can't put code above 64k. So this is now all data tables. Uh, and entertainingly I also found a letter to Dr. Livingston in it in multiple languages. I may have mentioned that before. Uh, which is obviously some test data. Good! We have now reached the end of our 64k address space, which means that there are going to be no more instructions to test on. So let's go start from the top and look for instructions I haven't implemented. This all looks full. Uh, D0 is garbage. Okay, I have completed uh, bank 1. Bank 2. Ah, 7, 8. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 7, 8 is here. These are garbage. C0, F, E, D, C. This is garbage. Okay, I've completed bank two. Bank three. This one is this hole here, and is garbage. Five zero, these two holes are garbage. Five eight is all garbage. Six eight is likewise garbage. So it is seven eight. Uh, these are mostly garbage. Right, no empty instructions. I've completed bank three. Bank four. Oops, that's the wrong line. Right, I completed bank four. This means that all the instructions are uh, interpreted and there should be no more unimplemented templates anywhere. So this should go all the way to the end of the file if I press Shift G. It takes a while, this is 256k of it, and there we are at the end of the file. And it has successfully disassembled everything. Good. Wow, uh, okay. That was quite a lot of data entry. We are not completely finished because we wish to emit the disassembly in a slightly cleaner fashion. So we're actually going to have uh, we're going to change our output buffer so that instead of just being the instruction it's also going to be the the complete buffer we're going to write to the to the output. So it needs to be longer, we're going to make it, you know, 80 bytes. There's a limit as to how long the instructions can be. Uh, this is enough to span one line of uh, normal code. Uh, we wish to So our print routines here write to the output buffer at output len. So how are we going to do this? Right. 
we wish to So what we're going to do is we're going to write various things to the buffer and then emit the buffer to the console or to the file in one go. Uh, however, we can't emit the, the hex dump until after we've read the instruction. And reading the instruction will write to the buffer. So we actually want to tell it, I didn't want to do that, where the... Uh, where we want to start writing. So, we're going to set up some constants here that describe the sync buffer. The address starts at position zero. The uh, then we have three bytes, this is going to be four bytes long. Then we're going to have the hex dump, which will start at position of the address, plus four characters, plus three characters for the separator. After the hex dump, we're going to have the ASCII, which is going to be Uh, we can have up to six bytes per instruction, and they are, the hex for these is going to be three characters long. That includes the, the, the separator at the end, but not the colon and the space. The instruction will appear after the ASCII which will be six characters long, plus the separator. And I think that's it. So, we want you to start writing instruction at this point. Now, before filling in the, before writing the instruction, we need to clear the buffer to all spaces. So that's going to be uh, output buffer zero uh, and so output buffer. So that will, wait a minute, I don't want to set it to zeros, I want to set it to spaces. So we have now read the instruction and disassembled it into the appropriate place. We wish to... This, give, this means we now know how long the buffer is going to be. So zero terminated. Now we are going to write the address. Now we are going to write the hex dump. Uh, now we are going to write the ASCII, however, we also want to put the separator in first because we can't put that after the hex dump because the hex dump is going to be variable width. And now we want to write the separator for the 
uh, instruction and then print the whole thing to the console. And here we have our nicely formatted disassembly. Okay, and we also need to rename output len to output pos because it is no longer even slightly the length of the output buffer. Yep, this gives us a nicely collimated, tabulated disassembly. Okay, and instead of just printing it to the uh, console, we want to say if output file name is not set, then print it. Otherwise, uh, what did I call that? Otherwise, write it to the output file. Followed by a new line. Okay, so here it is printing directly to the console. But if I put output to the disassembly, oh, it did something. Do we have a file? We have a file. It's got our stuff in it. Excellent. Quite a lot of stuff. Okay. Uh, and I think there is one more thing left to do. This is all looking pretty finished, which is, let's just check that we can set the origin. Yep, that looks like it set the origin. All the addresses are different. Right, now, there is a, uh, it should be finished, except I actually want to check this, which I forgot to do earlier. We had to add this plus two offset to the 8-bit displacement. Do we also need it for the 16-bit displacement? Now, the only way to find this out is to try and find a... Uh, a use of the instruction and see whether it makes sense. I suspect that if this has plus two, then this needs to have plus two as well, but I actually want to... Well, that that's, a, that's garbage. That, that did, that's garbage. Yeah, these are t data tables. This might not be garbage, but I suspect it is. The code looks a little bit too weird to be make sense. That's clearly garbage. This is a counting table. Uh, yep, this is also garbage. Right, there are no actual uses of JRL in the actual code. Uh, where else can we find a 16-bit displacement? We have color. Nope. 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 Have to go all the way up to Nope. 
Oh. Potentially. I don't think so, because this instruction, it makes no sense. All right. They're just not using that addressing mode. Does B712 actually point at anything? It doesn't even point near an instruction. Okay. Uh... I wish I could search this, but it's just a bitmap. So there were some jump instructions. They were here, but these are uh, do not do rel they don't do relative uh, displacements. So I think that the only two instructions that use that as addressing modes are JRL and color which uh, should be which is there's another typo here mm, you know what I am going to assume that because there's a plus two offset for this then there must also be a plus two offset for this and I'm going to add this to here Right, now let's see how big this thing is. Probably quite because of all the tables. Mm. 4K of data table. How about the CPM version? Uh, and CPM said 12K. That's quite big for a CPM executable. And most of that is repeated strings. Well, so let's take a look at. Yeah, bank four, very nearly every row is like repeated sequences of eight uh, templates except for 20, 30, 38 and 40. Everything else is the same. So let's actually just try to be F8 so does it match this row Actually, we can be smarter than that. It's 
So we can filter out most of the exceptions right here. Seven. I think there are no more exceptions. There are no more exceptions. Okay, so we, ch we check to see if it's an exception. If it's not, we follow one of the rules. So this will be more code, because the code to do this is more complicated, but much smaller data tables, and I think this will be a overall improvement. I'll repeat that for this. this and everything else is garbage so we reduce that entire 256 entry table to this function so this has gone from 12142 bytes to Wow, we chopped 2k off. Does it still work? Eh, probably. Um, yeah. Okay, let me hold down the U button for a while and undo everything I did. Okay, save. And hold down Control R and put it all back again. Right, we now have a snapshot of the state of the disassembler uh, before we made that change. So I should be able to just say compare before, after, they're different. That's because these should be calls. Right, they're the same. So uh, our two versions are equivalent. And we can do precisely the same for bank three. Uh, And bank two as well. So, uh, yeah, let's just do that. Two 
do wonder how long this video is going to be. Um, okay. Same but div one seven is uh, garbage error exceptions. Exceptions are at five three and five seven. And then we've got these five three return five seven return. There's still some more to do, but it is Yes, this is so much better. Let's find zero. Template is. And we've done those two exceptions. Six zero. Seven zero Okay, these ones are more exceptions, so that's eight seven. Same for nines. So disassemblers are supposed to be small and simple, and I originally thought I was going to knock this out in a couple of hours. I'm very interested to know how long this video ends up being once I splice all the bits together. Okay. that to after diff right bank two uh, there's a little bit more work in bank two. Oh yeah how big is our file now yeah we chopped off another good kilobyte and a bit
Okay, we're going to do the same thing we did before. Here, uh, are we? Yeah, we are. For consistency. So when oh, it's ten. Unfortunately, Calgol doesn't do range when statements yet. It'd be really nice to have, but they're actually harder than you might think they would be. I have a blog write up on just how tricky case can be when you care about size. There are lots of really obvious optimizations to make that are totally not worth it. Okay, so these are all exceptions. Zero. I think it's all plain sailing from here on in. Oops, that's the wrong button. X A eight. X zero. In fact, what I've essentially done is reverse engineered the instruction decode logic, which was what I originally tried doing and failed. But I seem to have done this rather through a rather strange backdoor method. But it seems to be working. Sub bank two. Uh, what's wrong there? Oops. Yep. Okay. Capture that to after. Diff it. Lots of breakages. Okay, what did I do wrong? I didn't implement this. Rule. Uh, that is what was it? That's the uh, test zero. These ones, um, yeah, one oh, test add, add one comma zero, and it does need to be one of these, right? And it's done. Uh, we could probably rulify at least some of the base page, but I'm not going to because it's frankly it's much clearer not. 
How big is our executable? 8k. Yeah, we managed to chop quite a lot off that. Let's look at the 386 version. Yeah, reasonable. And if you look at the code, uh, there's still quite a lot of duplications, but uh, that is a lot better. Awesome. So we have a fully functional disassembler for the TLCS90. The next step, I suppose, is to write an assembler, and won't that be fun? Anyway, it's done now. I can smell my dinner, which has been there for quite a while. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments.